Good morning, City Hill Church. So good to be with you. I think by now you've already worked out that uh, we're having a few technical issues today, but this is, you know what is good about these technical issues is these are the ones that are helping us to grow in uh, being able to serve you. We try new things all the time, and I think today is the first time we are actually uh, broadcasting live from two different places. So uh, we've had Rich and Annie, and thank you, Rich and Annie, for serving us so well this morning in, in worship. And and now we're here, and we get to worship God together in, in this way. So uh, I know that you're a people of grace, and I, that's what we love about you all. So thank you for uh, bearing with us. Each week, we're going to get better and better. Here's just something I want to read, uh, something short. Mark Twain said this, When I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant I could hardly stand to have the old man around, but when I got to 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. Uh, maybe maybe you you relate to that, and you're just going, oh, man, man, I can't believe how much my dad has has increased and how much wisdom he's actually gotten in the last few years, because, you know, as teenagers, you really believe that you, you've got it all. But, uh, yeah, just shout out to all our fathers in City Hill. Uh, can I just encourage you guys, you know, you're men who are shaping future generations, and this is an opportunity for us. Uh, you know, remembering Father's Day, and I'm talking to dads right now and, and people who will one day be dads, we got the opportunity to sh shape future generations and in that way shape the future of this world. Let's not, let's not waste that. Let's take it, let's use it, and uh, may God help you to be the best fathers ever, that one day, generations in the future will look back and say, that generation of fathers, those guys who were sitting in City Hill Church, they made a difference in this world for God's glory. Well, today we're going to carry on in uh, James, and uh, if you've got your Bible with you, you can turn there. If you've got a phone, you can turn there uh, on your phone. I guess you've got some Bible app or something, and if you don't have either one of those, guess what? I'm going to be putting the words on the screen, so you can just read here. And I'm going to read verses 13 to 18 today. James chapter 1, verses 13 to 18, and it goes like this. No one undergoing a trial should say, I'm being tempted by God. Since God is not tempted by evil, and He Himself doesn't tempt anyone, but He each person is tempted when he is drawn away and enticed by his own evil desire. Then, after de desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. By his own choice, he gave us birth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Today, I'm going to picking up on the, the topic enduring through trial. And I believe this is an, uh, through temptation at least, and this is a, a, an important one. And one of the things James is doing as he writes this letter is encouraging people who have been scattered because of persecution. They've been, you know, persecution has come, they've had to be, leave their homes, they've had to go through severe trial, and, uh, but he, what he's saying to them, I want you to keep going, keep going, don't give up. And we need that kind of encouragement all the time. I think this is a season of trial for probably every one of you uh, in some way or, or another. So we need people to cheer us on. Not in an empty way, this, uh, but in a way that's grounded. In a way that we've got something to stand on and hold on to. And that grounding can't be just like, oh, think positively in this world. It's like, there's no foundation to that. It's like, ah, oh, I can just think happy thoughts. It's got to be something solid that you can hold on to because when the going gets tough, you, you need to go somewhere. And this is what 
uh, we are being reminded of here. We are being reminded of how the gospel affirms God's presence, even when we don't feel it. And I know that some of you are facing trials, you've been going through trials, and sometimes, doesn't, isn't it true that the, the God seems far? But the Word of God tells us that He is near. Don't forget that. And this is what James wants us to understand. And today, the, uh, the encouragement that he's giving to us is not just that don't give up, it's don't give in. The, these are times when the pressure is to compromise what we believe, and, but what we believe needs to inform our response to these days as well. So we're talking about the testing of your faith. And today, it's in particular around the subject of temptation. That's an area that goes really deep. I mean, I said that last time I was speaking into this. There's, there's pressure. Trials come from the outside, but many trials are from the inside. Many of our trials are, are what we're struggling with, wrestling with on the inside of us in response to even what's on the outside. And how do we do that? And there are three things I want to speak into today. And the first thing is this. It's know the potential of your trial. That's, so the thing is this. We will face trials. You know that. I know that. Everyone knows that. When we face trials, we are brought to a place of a crisis of belief. And it's really going like this. Whose report are we going to believe? Who are we going to believe? And that's why James is saying that the trials are really a testing of your faith. Will we believe God or are we going to believe something else? And we need God's perspective as we travel on, on the bumpy roads of life. Because unless we get God's perspective into this, we, we're going to lose our way. And there's purpose in the trials. And it depends whose perspective you look at. It will tell you what the purpose is. You see, because there's, there's two sides. On the one side, God. When God... God is in the trial with you. He's wanting to use it to develop you, to grow you, to perfect you. He wants to help you grow to maturity and you grow in your character and godliness. But on the other side, there, there is the devil. He wants to use that same trial not to build you, not to help you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to rob you of your joy, rob you of your peace. And we're going to see in a minute what he does. You see, in that same trial, God wants to, you to look up to him and find hope. He wants you to look up to him as the satisfier of your soul, as the one who will help you through it. The devil wants you to look out. He wants to, you to see Look around and not look up. He doesn't want you to see hope. He doesn't want. He wants you to be filled with despair. And you know what? I, I, those of you on social networks like Facebook, I mean, sometimes I get off Facebook, and I'm filled with despair because I'm looking out, and I'm listening to that 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 horrible attitudes that people have and the the bad perspectives of life and trials. And if we fill our minds just with those things, we're allowing Satan into our lives and he is tempting us to despair. And God is saying, look up. Look up. Look to me. I am the hope giver. So what's your response then? I'll tell you what we need to be doing. God's calling us to fight through those temptations. Here's a scripture I want you to see. You probably know this quite well, but it's 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. It says this, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. So it's nothing unusual. What you face is nothing unusual. And God is what? Faithful. He's faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out. Now, we often put the full stop there, don't we? Look at this. 
so that you can stand up under it. God's in purpose is not to take you away from the trial and just deliver you from it so that life is just dandy. No, God wants you to give, wants to give you the ability to stand up under it. And that's what he does. Not fill you with despair, but strengthen you in it. It's amazing what trials actually develop in us. But don't forget this. God is faithful. And God will use that trial. He wants to strengthen you so you can uh, stand up under it. He is promising that I will be with you through this trial. That's the first thing that I want you to get. And the second thing is this. Know the potential of your heart. Because in the moment of trial, temptation is real. Temptation is real because it appeals to what is already in our hearts. You're never tempted with what's not already there. This is why we, you know, blame is not shifted when we give in to temptation. We need to accept it because it's, it's here. It's my responsibility. I chose that route. You know, it's amazing how many people go, you know, Satan made me do it. Satan didn't make you do it. You chose to do it. And this is what we find in this passage that we are looking at. Um, you chose to do this. You see, because we're tempted with what is already in us. And I'm going to unpack that in a minute. But here's the thing. The devil is an expert at highlighting what's already there. If you find yourself in the place of temptation, know that that was already there. Satan never put it there. It was there. He's highlighting it for you. And he's saying, that's what you need if you're going to be happy. That's why we need to fight this. Now, Paul Tripp illustrated this in a, actually a very helpful way, I think. Uh, he was at a family, you know, when, when he was a child, he was at a family gathering, and one uncle had too much to drink. And so his speech became a bit foul, below the belt. And his mom quickly got all the kids together and ushered them out to the car and said to them, nothing, there's nothing that comes out of the mouth of a drunk that was not there in the first place. See, this is the same, same thing that was there. Just the filters were removed. The ability to control it was removed. And here's the thing I want you to see. Temptation tests our hearts. It tests what we believe will satisfy our heart's desires. Now, I think there's something to understand here. And, you know, just in terms of our salvation, there's... The scriptures talk about our salvation in three tenses. We, it says that we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. So when we, when we say we have been saved, that's regeneration. That is our justification, our propitiation, you know, what God has accomplished for us. So I can stand before you today and go, I am fully saved. I am fully a child of God. It's not like I hope to become a child of God. I'm fully that. I am adopted into God's family. I'm so secure. I've been justified legally. I'm declared righteous before God. But I'm also being sanctified. And what's happening there? Sanctification is that journey where God is taking me from where I am to where, uh, to, to where I am to what he says, I am. You see, I'm still learning to get rid of sin. There's, the power of sin has been broken. The back of it has been broken at the cross. But now the presence of sin is still there, but I'm, I don't have to give it into it anymore. I don't have to be its slave anymore. I, he has given me victory over that. So I don't have to sin. I do. I don't have to. And this is sanctification because as I go with Jesus, he teaches me along the way to hate sin more and to love him more. Some of us fall along that way because we love sin more and hate him more. He wants us to switch that around. He's taking us from the place where we love our sin too much. 
to actually hating that sin so that we love him enough. And that's our journey right now. One day we will be glorified where sin is eradicated completely. We are in the presence of God for eternity. And that's the hope of the Christian life. But I'm secure of my glorification because of my salvation. And my sanctification is taking me from that place of who I am to being who God wants me to be. Now, temptation is going to test you along that way. And it's in that place of our uh, sanctification that we face. And this is where we live. And we struggle with these things. But you see, temptation then reveals what's in our hearts. So we're struggling with what is there. This is where we're living. We're learning to say no to sin and yes to righteousness. So here's a scripture I think you know. Matthew 5, 19, where it says, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Christian, you know that even you can do all of those things. It doesn't please God. We have the potential. Just thinking, didn't you find it sad this past week, listening to our president stand up to speak a little bit about COVID and then speak a lot about the abuse of women in our society? I think it's heartbreaking. I, I don't know where you are. Maybe you're sitting in a home right now where there has been abuse. Pray, it's not true. But isn't that a sad reality in our world that, you know, where there's this moral righteousness all around us and people are believing that they are just fine. And then, and then we just look at how devastating a devastated society is because of the uh, prevalence of sin and the hardness of people's hearts. Look at what he says here. If you look in your Bibles, it, he takes us through the process of this. This is, you know, uh, and you might be able to relate to this because if you can just think of a time when you said something or did something that you felt was out of character with you. Maybe it's best not to tell the person sitting next to you. Or maybe it is good later. Have you got that? Do you realize that was there? It wasn't something new. It might sh have shocked you because it was sort of tucked away in the background of your, your heart. And, and, and then something emerged and something opened that door and allowed that ugliness, to that sin to arise. Look at what the process of temptation is that uh, James speaks about. He speaks about temptation that is conceived. It starts within. It's lured by our own desire. This is, this is right at that place. That conception of, of, of temptation is where we need to really fight. We need, you know, that at the conception, we shouldn't even give the devil a foothold. That's what Ephesians chapter 4 says. And sometimes we, we know the truth, but there's a conflict in us, isn't there? Because that conflict is about what we want. Actually, I really want something that God says no to. I think that's a challenge. Fight at the place where sin is conceived. Sometimes we entertain that, though, and so that's the second, the second stage is temptation entertained because if we entertain the conception of that sin, so, you know, guys, let me speak to you right now. You might be on your computer and you're busy doing some work and suddenly you're on the web and you're clicking around and suddenly there's an inappropriate ad that pops up or something. 
Or it's just a temptation in your heart and you go, well, let me click on that. You see, you shouldn't have done that. Nip it in the bud right there. When you conceive, uh, uh, entertain what is conceived, you're standing, you're already in line for trouble. So John Owen, he said this. When we harbor sinful desires and open the door to temptation, we are letting in the enemy for a conversation. No, don't do that. We don't want to have a conversation with the enemy. We don't want to allow him to come. We don't want to entertain him. We're not allowing the enemy into our lives to come and sit down and have coffee with us. Now, when he shows up, we slam the door in his face and we say, get lost because I have nothing to do with you. I'm not yours. So we come, temptation, when it's conceived, then it's entertained, and then it's matured. And when it's matured, it brings forth death. There is always destruction and barrenness resulting from sin. Did you get that? There is always destruction and barrenness resulting from death. I've been around for too long to know in my own life when I'm entertaining something that is not of God, that is sinful, my spiritual life. It's not even tepid, it's cold. We can't harbor this. You know, when you're giving into temptation, you're, the devil is your biggest cheerleader. But he's out to, skill, uh, to uh, steal, kill, and destroy. He's not going, he's your biggest cheerleader, but he's not your biggest friend. He's not the guy who's going to pick you up out of the mess at the end. He's going to laugh when you fall. Because that's what he was after in the first place. A sinful heart. Know this, friends. A sinful heart can never be satisfied. The heart doesn't want to take responsibility. This is the very reason why, you know, even like in court cases, somebody who's done something bad tries to get an insanity plea. It's because they want to take away that responsibility. They want to find, oh, well, something, somebody else, or even oh, my other side must be responsible, but it's not me. Maybe you've used this excuse, oh, well, I was just born that way. I've got an anger problem. I've got an anger problem. That's an anger problem. I love the way, you know, I don't love it, but how, so, so often, you know, us guys in particular, we go, well, we're not emotional. But like next thing, we've got an ang anger issue. It's like we're throwing a plate across the room. Isn't that emotion? It's just like sinful emotion. I just want to say and Jenny can testify, I've never thrown a plate across the room. Don't think. No. I know her brother hits her over her head with a plate, but that's another story. Friends, if you're a believer, a follower of Christ, and you're listening to me today, you've been born again. You will face the struggle. You don't have to surrender to it. The victory has been won. We live in the shadow of the cross where Christ has won the victory for us. So I want to bring you to the third point that is highlighted in this passage. Know your God. In the fight against temptation, it's essential that we are aware of our God that we see and marvel at his beauty and then respond. Unless you got something greater. I mean, Sibs helped us with this last week when he was speaking about idolatry. And, you know, just go back and listen to that. But 
we, we, need, we need to get a great vision of our wonderful God in order to fight temptation. And here's some things I want to bring out from this passage. One is God is good. He's good. That idea actually saturates this passage that we've just read. You know, it's the good news for us. Our hearts may deceive us, but God is always good. God can't tempt you. God won't tempt you. You've got to believe that. You've got to hear me on that. God can't because he's God and he's perfect and he's pure. And God won't. <coughs> Temptation is designed to draw you away from God rather than create affection for God. And some of you may be given into temptation because you're saying, I'm not going to believe in the goodness of God. It's as simple as that. You're going, I don't believe in God's goodness. I don't believe that what he wants for me is good right now, so I'm going to, I'm going to choose my own way. But God's always good. There's never a time that he's not good. All his ways are good. Everything he says is good. And we need to saturate our minds with this truth. <coughs> we need to speak it to each other. Just got to have some water. Because we want to encourage each other to look up and to see the goodness of God. I was reminded, just writing that down, that song, I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes, I'm going to sing of it. I'm going to remind myself of it. Maybe that's what you need to be doing when you enter that time of temptation and, you, and sin is staring you at the face and it's luring you in, that saying, come in. Maybe it's time to deflect your attention and look up and look again and sing of the goodness of God. But God is also generous. He gives good gifts to his children. I love thinking of God's love, lavish love. For his children. It's just beautiful. He's a lavish God. If, you, if you're a Christ follower today, you're his child. He's a father that's better than any one of the fathers that's watching online today. He's way better than me. Way better than any one of you. Don't look at your earthly father to see what your heavenly father looks like. Even, even the best of earthly uh, fathers is, is pale in, a, in comparison to how wonderful our God is, how generous our God is. Here's Psalm 84, verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord grants favor and honor. He does not withhold the good from those who live with integrity. He doesn't withhold the good. He's generous. Isn't that wonderful? And then he's holy. He's pure. Interesting, he's called the father of lights. See, there's no darkness in him. Light dispels darkness. The deeds of darkness are things that are hidden. The deeds of darkness are things that are tucked away and trying to keep away from the light. But when the light shines through, they're exposed. And that's why, you know, if you're watching today, maybe you're, you're cringing at some of what I'm saying because it's like you're feeling it so sensitively today because the light, God is shining his light and is exposing what's in the dark. One of, one of the ways to break the back of sin in our lives is to bring what is in the darkness into the light. See, some of you are more fearful of what your friends will think, what your family will think. You don't care what God thinks. You should be worried about what God thinks. He sees. He's the father of lights. If you're living in the dark, hiding things in the dark, you will never be free. God's calling you to freedom. I really believe that. Today, God is calling some of you to freedom. And that's going to involve, you know, what you're going to feel like risk is taking something that's in the darkness and, and bringing it to, into the light. 
with those who have been effect, affected by your sin and asking forgiveness and healing and restoration. The fourth thing is this, God is constant. He does not change. That should be an encouragement for us. See, the God of Genesis 1 is the God of Revelation. He's the same God. He's the God of 2020. He's constant. What he was in the beginning, that is who he is today. He doesn't change. It brings comfort to me. I and mean, we're, we're living in a, a day of relativism where everything is relative. It's like, ah, oh, well, I, you know, what I believe is personal. It's, it, I choose to believe this. I don't, I don't want to believe that. How? You can't have hope with that. You can only hope when you see God and put your trust in a God who is constant, who is always the same. I, I can't find hope any other way. Only in Him. And then the fifth thing is God is the sovereign Savior. Your salvation was His own choice. His own choice. But I chose Him. You chose Him because He chose you. That's the greatest proof of God's goodness and God's graciousness and generosity. It is sovereignty. He chose to give us something that we could never have attained or found. That was the new birth. That is the key to being a child of God. You, the scriptures say you must be born again. If you want to know him, you must be born again. When you're born again, you get to call him father. You get to know that you've been saved. That you've been justified. You get to stand with this assurance that I'm being sanctified and I will be glorified. Friends, I just want to say if that's what God is like, He wants an expression of Himself to be manifest in you. And we need to remind ourselves of these truths of God in our fight against temptation. We, we're not here. Well, this isn't games. We are, God is calling us to lives of surrender to Him because He's worth it. It's easy when you see how worth it He is. In just... Coming up to this message, I was praying, Lord, you know, is there any group of people that you maybe you want to touch particularly today? And just there was one group that sort of re really resonated with my heart a lot. And it, it's a group where you think you can fit Jesus into your, li your life, but you won't embrace his goodness in all of life. In other words, you would choose why you want to live and carry on doing what you want to do, but you know, God's ways are sometimes an intrusion on your life. I want to say to you today, and I feel God wants to say, you're just pretending to follow Jesus because it's convenient for you. You won't count the cost. And he's called you to count the cost. You arrogantly believe that it's okay to live like that and that God's okay with it. Friends and men, some of you know what I'm talking about right now. You're not leading your families to Jesus. This is a time for renewal, for change to rise up. You know, Matthew 26 says, What will a profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? You're going for the world, but you haven't cared about what matters most. God is calling you to repent. Maybe it's some wives, maybe it's some young people, young adults who are watching this. 
Maybe you just thought that's, that's how I can do life because our, our society and our, even our Christianity has become so consumeristic. God is calling you to lay down your life and follow him. Why don't you do it today? I'm going to ask right where you are, right in your lounge. Maybe you need to get down on your knees before God today. Raise your hands to him and say, Father, I surrender. You love me. Your way is good. Don't worry about what other people in the lounge think. Sometimes we're so worried about what other people are going to think about me. This is where it's going to start. It's before God. What does he say to you right now? Father, I want to pray for those who are kneeling down in their homes right now. I want to pray that for these men, for these women, these boys and girls who, who may be at this place where they're going, I, I, I can't do it on my own. My way is not right. God's way is. We're recognizing that you have paid the price for our sin. That you went to the cross to die for our sin. And that wasn't cheap. We're not here to mess around with eternity. So I want you, Father, build faith. Raise our eyes. Help us not to be filled with despair and looking out into this world, but to look up and see the King of glory. I pray, Father, for revival in these days. Do great things through the men and women of City Hill Church. I pray that there will be a generation of men that will rise up who will, without shame, lead their families to the cross. Lead the families to Jesus. Lead their families to encounter God. Bring revival, Lord, in Jesus' name. God bless you all.